Hello, and welcome to Calibrated, a webcast about uncertainty, Bayesian inference, and machine learning. I'm your host, Eric Novick, and I'm very excited to have Jonathan Erbach joining us today. Welcome to the program, Jonathan. Uh, thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So you're currently an assistant professor of statistics at George Mason University, but your undergrad was in economics. How did you yep. get into stats? Well, so I graduated into the recession in 2010, and I got a job where I interned as a, uh, in a, the New York City's legislative office. And so I stayed there for about a year or two. And then I, I was thinking about moving on or moving up. And I was told, well, you need a master's. So I went, I think that's where I met you. I got a master's at Columbia in statistics. And then I kind of fell into the PhD program. And then I kind of guess fell into a postdoc at the American Statistical Association and, and fell into the current position at Mason. Gotcha. A lot of falling. Uh, and you, you, a lot of falling into things. <laughs> um, and you, you also have been doing a lot of policy work, right? So you, you, you were doing some policy work in the city of New York and you kind of followed that. What's your sort of interest in policy as a, as a statistician? So when I was an undergrad in economics, I took a stats class I had to. I think I did okay in it. I think I got a B plus. I can't remember. Um, I thought the notation was confusing. Um, I wasn't really that into statistics. I liked econometrics. I liked the modeling aspect, but I thought the probability and the inference was confusing. And then I went in, uh, I started a job in policy working with the city's legislature in New York City. And um, I started looking at the evidence that was being used to justify um, policy. I thought... Um, uh, this is all chasing statistical artifacts. None of this is real, right? All these crime reductions and, you know, all these uh, lead testing, people following lead testing, it's based on false positives. So I, um, that sparked my interest in statistics. And then that's why I went, you know, the policy's always kind of been with me, but I've been particularly interested in how statistical artifacts um, distort the type of reasoning people do and how we can do it better. Yeah. What, what are some, I, I remember you did some cool stuff in, in like policing in, in Frisk and Stop in New York, or yeah. what, what are some of the, would you say some of the more interesting things that you've done there? Yeah, I, I've done a lot of, I guess I, I was, I think I was at one point, I'd been to every StanCon, I'd done city type uh, analyses using Stan. Um, and then I didn't make the, the last one, 2020. I don't know what happened in 2021. But I didn't make nobody the knows, Nobody knows. Nobody knows what happened in 2020. Nobody knows what happened. I remember them yeah. saying there was going to be something in it. But uh, hey, if, if if you know StanCon should be at Mason in 2020, whatever, whatever the next one is. So some of the stuff I've done is I've looked at uh, estimating the rat population in New York City. I've looked at stop, question, and frisk. I've looked at uh, whether tickets are uh, a, a follow a quota system if there's data evidence. Uh, typically, uh, examples where I think people are using data, but their reasoning is very sloppy, and then I try to go in and tighten it. And um, oftentimes you'll find that the, the phenomenon reverses. Mm. And so I'll have some examples, I think, in this talk um, where um, uh, specifically when it comes to things like crime, crime is a uh, so, so, so crime and stop question and frisk. Everyone comments on the spike in crime in the 90s in, across cities. Um, but what people neglect to mention is that there were also uh, uh, an effort to uh, criminalize uh, very minor offenses under this broken windows uh, type policy, they would say, oh, well, you know, we don't really care about broken windows or broken up cars or littering, but by targeting those um, those offenses, we get at the actual. Um, so initially crime spikes, but of course crime's going to spike because you just took a bunch of things that people were doing already and you criminalized them for it. So I think people hear about spikes in crimes in the 90s. Yes, there were increased homicides and whatnot, but a lot of crime, if you look at the data, is the increased criminalization of formerly not criminalized things. And I think that uh, greater, uh, there needs to be greater care the statisticians should be more interested in these projects, and there needs to be greater uh, care differentiating between actual changes in human behavior and what's an artifact of the measurement process. In this case, that reported crimes actually measure something about human behavior that we don't like. Yeah. Yeah, the broken windows was funny. Uh, it, th this was Giuliani era policy, was it not? Did he? Did he uh, did started, he started with Dinkins, actually. David Dinkins, who oh, David. Uh, was a Assessor. Yeah. And then it became big there. Uh, Giuliani beat Dinkins in um, there was a series of riots that happened towards the end of the Dinkins administration. Uh, but this, mm. yeah, tough on crime policing is it definitely a product of late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. And, and I remember it was sort of touted as one of these very successful programs. Uh, yeah. Bloomberg for, led with it in, in his yeah in his 20, uh, 20 run. Um, he got up there and said, yeah. uh, basically, I did stop question and frisk because it worked. Yeah, we, you know, it was like Obama and yeah, we tortured some folks. Uh, I think Bloomberg <laughs> admitted, yeah, you know, we, we violated some civil liberties. I think uh, uh, so this uh, ACLU um, uh, or NYCLU, uh, New York Civil Liberties Union, um, sued and won. 
to stop, stop question and frisk, although it was lessened, it's still around today. It's just, you know, lessened. I think under the, had a Bloomberg administration continued into a fourth term, it would have been challenged. Just the Blasio administration chose not to challenge it. The, the basis of stop question and frisk are these Terry stops. It's these, you're allowed to stop people in their cars. You can set up a line and stop people as long as it's indiscriminate. You can't discriminate, which was the basis. Um, but if you're going to violate civil liberties, um, and uh, actually, this is actually pertinent to what I'll talk about today. But if you're going to violate civil liberties and claim that you're reducing crime, you better be able to demonstrate. I mean, you, you should not violate civil liberties, full stop. Um, however, is it even true that there were massive reductions in crime as a result of these violations? And I don't think that the evidence has been so. It's a lot of spurious correlations. I don't think people have carefully reassessed the evidence. In my opinion, I'm not convinced. Gotcha. All right. Well, before we turn it over to you, what's your tool stack? What do you typically use in your sort of analysis daily uh, basis? I use R, R Studio, Stan, R Stan. Now I use R Command Stan or Command Stan and R instead of uh, mostly since the, we talked about this, the recent uh, install crisis of uh, whenever the, the Mac operating system changed. My uh, Usually I um, have some type of missing data, some type of partial pooling that needs to be done with a hierarchical model in Stan. Um, and the question is what types of distributions faithfully uh, um, recreate the type of data I'm observing? Um, which I suppose is just summarizing Aki's uh, talk on workflow. Very well. Everyone can go listen to that one. It's, good. it's a good one. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Uh, so take it away. All right. Well, thanks again for having me today. Again, I'm Jonathan Auerbach, Assistant Professor of Statistics at George Mason University. You can contact me. My email's there. The title of this talk is, Could Voting Restrictions Be Increasing? Um, election fraud it refers to a finding of a paper I wrote with Steve Pearson that I'll talk about, where we find empirically uh, through uh, we try we cut the data several different ways, and each time we find that uh, expanding um, access to voting through vote by mail um, led to decreases in the reported amount of election fraud. And so, uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll try to answer the question: um, Why do I think that is? Uh, the 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 finding is very real. The question is: Does it mean that there's some protective benefit of ex um, of expanding the um, the uh, voting? But before that, I'm going to talk kind of broadly about the type of research in this this statistics and public policy field. And I'll talk about uh, my time as a, I did a postdoc um, at the American Statistical Association. I was the 2020 2021 Science Policy Fellow. So I'll talk about the research that I did there. Um, I'll start with a kind of a simple example, the uh, measuring the quality of official statistics, such as the 2020 census, which uh, if you know something about the American Statistical Association and its history, it's very consistent with the um, how historically the ASA has functioned as an advocacy, you know, promoting the practice of statistics. And then I'll talk about a more recent uh, function. Uh, uh, the ASA has been uh, writing amicus briefs before the Supreme Court. Uh, probably most famously evaluating the citizenship question and the likely effects on uh, census response rates. But I'm going to talk about a co comment that we did on um, asylum seekers and how uh, the Department of Homeland Security was analyzing asylum data. And then I'll move on to this, uh, and that, that'll be about five slides. Then I'll move on to the main example. Could voting restrictions be increasing election fraud? Uh, I have about 20 slides. Most of it, I think I don't really have to motivate to you or your audience. Um, how the data could be analyzed. We use pretty common tools of longitudinal um, analysis, uh, thinking about complete pooling and partial pooling and how should we combine experiences across states. The, the main thing I want to motivate is why you as, as data people, machine learners, statisticians should care. Why is it an important problem? Why are we not just tinfoil hat investigators? And, and why there's an actual interesting question here that, that I think deserves more study and hasn't gotten enough. In particular, I want to challenge this trade-off paradigm in which it's commonly accepted in policy circles that accessibility must come at the cost of uh, security. I'll review, uh, again, this data that, uh, analysis that I did with Steve Pearson, who's the director of science policy at the American Statistical Association. And then again, I'll conclude with my uh, uh, best answer to the central question, why would voting restrictions be increasing election fraud? And then I want to end uh, uh, this uh, bonus example about trying to figure out uh, what day the cherry trees will bloom, which is a really hard prediction problem. We, uh, I, uh, Lizzie uh, 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 Volkovich, who you've heard uh, speak at a previous Calibrated, um, and I um, and David Keplinger uh, created a prediction competition. We tried to predict it ourselves, and now we're encouraging other people to, to try to beat us. And I'll talk about that at the end. So just very, very briefly, why would a professional association do research? So I think I want to start with my observation about what is the role statisticians play in policy. 
you know, absent of a professional association. And really what we do is we detect and correct for statistical artifacts. We're sitting around studying the properties of randomness all day. We have strong opinions about when combining the data in various ways creates distortions. And so a statistical artifact is just that. It's when an instrument, the thing you're using to measure the phenomenon, distorts the phenomenon. And it's those distortions that get confused with the quantity of interest. So the classic example you saw, if you read uh, Andrew Gelman's blog, uh, people were confusing COVID positive test results with the actual incidence of COVID. And during the pandemic, false positives and false negatives distorted that measure of prevalence. And um, a few famous studies famously, uh, grossly underestimated the incidence of the disease. Another very famous one is the so-called healthy worker effect, comparing workers to non-workers, and that can distort measured risk of an illness. Statisticians are really the strongest, in my opinion, advocates for correct measurement, you know, detecting and correcting these artifacts. We don't see it in other professional associations in economics and uh, psychology and in, in, the, in uh, uh, physics, we don't see them advocating in government about correct measurement in the same way that statisticians have. And the ASA being one of the oldest professional associations, I believe uh, established in 1838, has basically since its inception been advising policy, promoting the practice, good practice of statistics. The Office of Science Policy and its director were created in 2007 in an effort to create a more timely response to important issues and has since uh, written about the federal statistical system, human rights. Generally, topics at the request of leadership or membership, it's taken on this very interesting role, though, in, in essentially communicating consensus. And um, a lot of people or a lot of statisticians or some statisticians, I don't know, might say, well, why can't you get ex esteemed professor so-and-so? Why do we need an, a professional association to comment? Why can't we get the esteemed professor to comment? And what happens is in, in policy, especially, you get the, the proponents find three people, three statisticians who support, say, climate change is real, three that don't. And um, because uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the um, opponents found three that don't, um, it looks like uh, there's a dissensus that, that you've created this equivalency and that nobody has to take it seriously because up oh, statisticians don't agree. When in fact, had you pulled statisticians, they would all agree, um, at least if not on the policy, on the, on the measurement aspects. So again, I have... Uh, Four examples here of um, this 2020 to 2021 science policy projects um, measuring the quality of the census. Um, the main concern in that measurement of quality is, is the 2020 census fit for use? Not just are there errors. Of course, there are errors. Are those errors so substantial? For example, the use of administrative data, you know, the use of proxies, et cetera, that they'll distort subsequent analyses that use the data. I'll talk about you know, consensus, how statistics consensus is communicated, for example, for the Supreme Court, as I said before, uh, what do asylum cases say about undecided? Or so what do decided asylum cases say about undecided asylum cases? So we had a um, increase in migration during the Trump administration. Early into the increase, a bunch of asylum cases had been decided, but there were still the vast majority had not been undecided. Should we be forming migration policy in real time based on the decided cases? And it's a great idea if the decided cases are representative. It's unlikely that they're representative, in which case it's a bad idea that, you know, you're essentially violating someone's human right. You know, the, according to the UN, you have a human right uh, to asylum and you don't want to violate that right. Then I'll move on to the main example, the title claim uh, about um, uh, the incidence of voter fraud and then this, this bonus example. Example one, uh, we studied the quality of the 2020 census. Essentially, we were given access to the data underlying uh, apportionment counts. Uh, to my knowledge, at the ASA, we were the only ones that were given underlying access to the data that weren't either paid by the Census Bureau or part of governments. So we were like one of the uh, independent in that respect. And so we took this, uh, what's called the total survey error approach. It's very interesting. If you don't know it, look it up, uh, where essentially you divide data collection into phases and assess error within each phase. You know, you can see, uh, here's a link here to, uh, to the report. It's about a 50, 60 page report on top of which the ASA task force that we, we wrote the report for wrote another report on top of that, uh, combining the work of other people as well. You, this total survey error approach should be thought of as another way of evaluating census quality. It's kind of like demographic analysis. Demographic analysis would break down population changes, uh, births, deaths, migration in, migration out, and use that to determine uh, whether the census is accurate. Does it agree with demographic data? And this was doing the same thing except with operational data. And then, of course, there's dual systems estimation, uh, this, this mark, recapture, capture, recapture, where you basically conduct another independent survey after the census and then compare the two. So as part of this, uh, our work is this, like a series of investigations. Census gets a lot of attention. 
just a real, uh, I include this plot because it was included on the, I what Eric called it, header for the, the talk. What we were basically looking at is differential error rates due to uh, uh, differences, differential operations, whether differences in how the census was conducted in different states could create differential error rates that put a portion at risk. And in these little pie charts, um, I, again, don't particularly support the use of pie charts, except in this, you know, when you want to also convey this spatial element as well. I mean, you can see across the country, in different parts of the country, this spatially, the uh, processes that are contributing the most to error are different in different parts of the country, suggesting that there uh, could be huge risk to a portion. Of course, we'll wait to see what other what the uh, other uh, checks say. Uh, but I think the census has already taken taken steps. My understanding is they're already um, for different types of releases. They're combining the data in different ways in order to uh, uh, make it more reliable. So you can see the the report exactly what we wrote. What do the acronyms uh, stand for? In that, uh... Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the the acronyms, the dreaded acronyms. It basically, math development uh, uh, reflects to the making of the um, sampling frame. So if you're going to run a census, you got to know where everybody is. You got to know where all the addresses are. Um, self-response refers to the operation in which you get people. You encourage them to self-respond themselves. NERFU is non-response follow-up. You know, a sizable percentage of the country, when the government said, hey, uh, uh, respond to the census, they said, no way. And uh, so then someone had to be dispatched, a call someone to their address to get the, the answers to the census. Then uh, when that failed, there was data processing. Uh, those were imputed with administrative data, you know, using proxies, ask the mailman, uh, et cetera. Um, and then there's an entirely separate operation for group quarters, which is it doesn't really show up here because it's such a small operation compared to the other ones. It, it, it's it's um, group living facilities, so uh, like college dorms, that type of stuff. So that's what the, yeah, I apologize for the acronyms. Example two was uh, we reevaluated evidence uh, used by the Department of Homeland Security to justify uh, essentially making asylum process more difficult. Again, and we'll get back to this security versus you know accessibility trade off. We drafted an argument uh, for an amicus brief. It was uh, Wolfie ILL Innovation Law Lab DHS, uh, Wolf being the head of the DHS at the time. Uh, DHS claimed basically asylum seekers don't show up for trial. We can take a procedural action that we can change the procedure because they're not showing up. But DHS only looked at concluded cases. They didn't look at cases that were ongoing you know, incorrectly assuming that the ongoing cases would resolve like the concluded cases that in general, asylum seekers don't show up for trial. When in reality, what was happening is there was a spike in migration and asylum seeking. And the concluded cases had been concluded precisely because the asylum seeker hadn't showed up. And that the other cases were ongoing precisely because the asylum seeker was showing up. So there was this uh, selection bias example. And so uh, we carefully lay out the argument for a selection bias. It's on the ASA website. I didn't include the link here. You can read the amicus brief. It was uh, subsequently legalized, which I, you know, an unfortunate, but I guess necessary step to being, uh, you know, used as evidence in a courtroom. I think we don't say, but we suggest that migrants' rights to impartial trial is being violated in that you're essentially by using um, the conclusion of cases under different circumstances, you're not being impartial anymore. You, you, you have to, you have to try, try each person independently was our, I think, the, uh, the, the, the legal side of the argument. And uh, it, it was of note is that the problem was originally identified by an ACLU attorney, excellent excellent attorney. It sparked this whole reaction at the ASA that now created a special policy for how and when the ASA comments on science policy, which anyone can, member or not, can submit and say, hey, wow, I, this is a horrible statistics mistake. I would love it if the ASA could comment on it. And so that was the asylum example. Uh, and I'm going to go to the main example, the title question, could voting restrictions be increasing election fraud? And so uh, I'm going to bro broke down the discussion of this paper into uh, four sections. Again, it's uh, wrote it with Steve Pearson. It's in statistics and public policy. The first part is, you know, why, why did we do the analysis? Basically, we did it. Uh, why, why does anybody do anything? Uh, we didn't think the current arguments were good enough. We didn't think they were particularly rigorous. So I'm going to give you some background on election accessibility and security. We'll talk about how voter fraud and disenfranchisement both go back to the founding of the U.S. History has really shaped the preconceived notions that advocates bring when they look at the data. So I'll say uh, full disclosure, you know, I, I think there's been some tinfoil hat analyses when it, when it comes to elections for sure, but I'm very hesitant to um, dismiss citizen science if people, I think people in this country, in the United States, have a right to download the data, analyze it, you know, share it with the world. Uh, we don't have a right to believe their claims, but they have a right to do it. People want to analyze the data. I wouldn't discourage them from doing so. And I think that uh, you can say everyone's a, a nut job and, you know, no one should be looking into the election. But really, I think uh, we should appreciate the types of uh, preconceived notions people are bringing to the analysis. 
try to educate and try to create a common narrative that solves the problem. At least that's in the ideal. Maybe I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm too naive. I'll talk about that. I'll talk about our analysis. We did a longitudinal analysis to study the relationship between reported election fraud and whether states conduct elections by mail. Then I'll respond to the question uh, that I posed. What's going on? So empirically, we find when you extend everywhere we look, when you extend accessibility through vote by mail, we see lower fraud rates. And I've seen it in some other publications. We cite them in the paper. I've since read through many of the cases, the fraud cases, and I think I have a pretty good idea what's going on. So uh, if you're listening, uh, maybe you can try to think what you think is going on and see if we, if we agree at the end. Why do we do it? We examine the claim that states uh, should expect more cases of voter fraud when ballots are distributed by mail, the so-called trade-off between accessibility and security. Uh, the research was conducted during the 2020 election. It was only later published in Statistics and Public Policy. So uh, we have uh, data going up to the 2020 election, but we don't really have any consequences of the 2020 election. So it's really uh, 2000 to 2020 inclusive. What was happening at the 2020 election? Well, vote by mail opponents were predicting a deluge of fraud. And they were so- citing this ever-growing database curated by the Heritage Foundation with, at the time, a 1,000 reported voter fraud cases, I think much more now. And then you had the vote by mail supporters who said, well, a thousand cases, that's a trivial percentage of the total votes cast. That's negligible. Why even, why even worry about it? For the purpose of this paper, we found both arguments. We took both arguments at face value. We didn't address any political motivations. We just said, okay, well, let's look at these arguments. Um, and we didn't find either particularly rigorous. And the reason why is because just having a thousand reported fraud cases doesn't say anything about policy. On the other hand, um, reported fraud cases could be a small sample of the total number of fraud cases. There are many crimes that are underreported, and you wouldn't you wouldn't say you know crime X is not a problem because um, not a lot of people report it. So, in our opinion, what would a rigorous investigation do? What's the most rigorous thing we can do? Well, I think we would examine whether reports reports cluster in ways that are consistent with fraud being increased by vote by mail policies. And if they don't cluster, if we can't find any clustering, then we probably think you know, there's not evidence of any any relationship. So that, that was the, the, the idea behind the paper. And so that's what we did. We examined whether reported fraud clusters around state changes in election policy. Um, we applied pretty common tools from uh, longitudinal data analysis. We used difference and difference. Uh, if you're not used to that, it's, it's kind of econ speak. It's basically complete pooling, which I'll, I'll talk about. And then we did a, a rank penalized regression. We actually did matrix completion, which I'll, I'll try to justify is basically partial pooling. Um, and I'll talk about that later. The main reason we did it is because I was tried as some zero inflated models and they couldn't quite fit the data. And um, for reasons I'll talk about later, which I suspect, the rank penalized regression worked, nuclear norm penalized regression worked really, really well. We compared US states by election policy. So it's at the state level, 50 states, 10 years. We found that voting by mail generally decreased reports of election fraud. Uh, for example, one of the, the estimates was that Washington would have reported 73 more cases of fraud between 2011 and 2019 had it not introduced its vote by mail law. Um, Washington, sub, but before 2011, didn't have a vote by mail law, switched in 2011, and then had a vote by mail law. I'll talk a little bit what I mean by switch, because um, it turns out that having a vote by mail law is not such a clear cut treatment. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. But the main point I want to make is that this appears to run contrary to generally accepted narratives about the trade-off between election security and accessibility. So what's going on here? Where does this trade-off come from? Where does this, why would anyone think there's a trade-off between election security and accessibility in the first place? You might not think that's true, but this trade-off assumption underlies much of policy research. It's at the core of how many social scientists think and uh, you know, economists, political scientists, including statisticians. You'll often hear about safety versus liberty, cost versus benefit, efficiency versus accountability. Um, And it's been my experience doing statistics and public policy, working for a legislature, working with uh, various government groups to do research, is that good policies often die simply because nobody took the time to overcome the knee-jerk reaction, you know, what about trade-off X? Evidence for X doesn't have to exist. Just someone just has to bring up the possibility and the burden is on the person promoting the policy change. And especially in our, our super partisan times, it's become even less likely that people will, will recognize these trade-offs. You just uh, further back into your own base um, about, uh, you know, our policy is amazing. There's no possible consequences. Well, let's not even entertain them. Any entertainment is treason. So regarding elections, what are the trade-offs? Well, you can really be party to two types of federal crimes, uh, campaign finance crimes notwithstanding. You can be guilty of voter fraud. So you can illegally cast a ballot. Uh, You can pay someone to cast a ballot. You can cast a ballot more than once. You can cast votes in someone else's name. And you can, as we'll see later, you can cast your ballot in the wrong way. 
And then, of course, you can be party to a civil rights violation. You can be the victim of or upon someone press a person's ability to vote, oftentimes through arbitrary or onerous requirements, deadlines, short windows, uh, making it very hard to get to the polls, short hours, long lines, that type of stuff. Um, this suggests a trade-off that by making it easier to vote, there'll be uh, more fraud and vice versa. By going after fraud, we'll inevitably get it wrong and go after somebody who's correctly voting and then infringe upon their right uh, to cast a ballot. I'll, I'll mention that statisticians particularly love a good trade-off story. Statisticians love trade-off. It's at the core of Naaman Pearson's statistical decision theory. A, a vote is either fraudulent or not. And the government, you know, whatever you take that to be, board of elections, law enforcement, legislature, either accepts or rejects the vote. And so we'll assume, uh, like a statistical hypothesis test, that governments, you know, errors. They can't perfectly predict whether or not a vote is fraudulent. So on this, the x-axis of this table, if tables have axes, you know, either the fraud is the vote is fraud or it's not. There's some truth. And then you'll see either the vote is accepted or the vote is denied. And if you deny a vote that's not fraud, you, you, there's an error. If you accept a vote that is fraud, there's an error. And otherwise, you're correct. Um, we'll see towards the end. I hate, I don't agree with this narrative. And I think it causes a lot of problems in policy analysis. It's a very convenient, I, I think researchers love these types is because the tools are then based on this type of reasoning. And so it allows them to apply these cookie cutter tools. I think the idea that a vote being a fraud or not fraud is not really true. It's, a, it's, it's a, and I'll talk about later after examining these fraud cases, what's really going on. So this gets to our research question. Uh, does the empirical evidence support a trade-off? If so, what's the exchange rate? Making uh, the vote epsilon more accessible leads to delta more, uh, uh, how much more fraud? What's the exchange rate between fraud and uh, accessibility? It's important to note that this is a very political uh, topic. It's, I think, important. I think it's worthy of studying. We should be studying the data. But it's important to note uh, the positions of advocates. And so while trade-off makes good theory, in practice, advocates rarely recognize a trade-off for reasons I suggested before. We typically have Democrats advocating for greater access, Republicans for greater security. Not always the case. Uh, very famously in New York, you know, which is very blue, you have uh, certain types of Democrats who want to, in the state level who want to protect their gains, uh, who, who are not particularly for increased accessibility. And, and for that reason, New York, despite being a fairly blue state, has some of the most arcane, uh, the least accessible uh, laws on the books. But typically, it's Democrats for Republicans for greater security, Democrats for uh, greater access, Republicans for greater security. And what you generally have advocates saying is that one error is much worse than the other. You can't compare the relative merits. There's no such thing as a trade-off. Advocates for security often say, hey, increasing accessibility will lead to huge increases in fraud. And then advocates for accessibility say, well, you know, you're, you're, people have a fundamental right to cast a vote. Um, reducing restrictions isn't going to produce that much fraud. All you're going to do is you're going to get people who vote. And, and what maybe uh, they would uh, say is the perceived increase in fraud it really just has to do with how people are, are submitting their ballots. They, they wouldn't call those fraudulent entries. And so you have these two kind of positions that, that seem um, that they can't both be true. They can't both exist. And so again, we take these arguments at face value, um, but we, well, what's important here is that this isn't about lizard people on the move. We believe that there's enough history supporting each side that they uh, cannot simply be dismissed without a close examination of the data, even if they are politically motivated. Unlike lizard people on the moon who control you know, politics, that, you know, no data that's going to falsify this. We do have data on the uh, reported number of fraud cases from this database I mentioned before. I think it, it deserves close scrutiny. So just getting to this idea of why proponents of election security believe that fraud is a problem, well, they often point to historically stolen elections. It's not hard to find. They're, they've been made popularized in books and movies. Great example, Caro talks about in a series of interviews in the years of Lyndon Johnson. You can look up the Box 13 scandal, how uh, Johnson um, uh, uh, was able to encourage votes um, in his Senate run. Great examples in Scorsese's Gangs of New York, uh, which, you know, is a dramatization of a very real, though, uh, machine that existed in Tammany Hall. Uh, this was the boss tweet era, the early era of Tammany Hall, where uh, I believe is uh, Leonardo DiCaprio's character confronts someone and says, um, you know, have you voted? He's like, oh, I voted three times already. And, and DiCaprio's like, oh, you know, three times you think you fulfilled your civic duty and, and pushes him back into the uh, into the booth. So uh, there's a long list of controversial elections at the local, state, and federal level. Famous one is the 1877 election. Uh, basically, the agreement to uh, fraud was claimed on both sides, and uh, the, the election that basically ended Reconstruction by putting a Republican as president it was the part of the compromise. But vote buying goes back to the founding of the U.S. It goes back to the colonies. 
And in fact, um, election security uh, has at times been considered a progressive activist agenda. On the other hand, you have, of course, accessibility. Proponents of accessibility point to uh, historic disfranchisement, um, most commonly Jim Crow laws, literacy tests, etc., that basically had no purpose other than to make it so African-Americans particularly couldn't vote. But there's a much bigger history of disenfranchisement that's often not told. There's, there's, um, I, don't, I don't know if you know, Eric, that uh, um, there was a time period in, in several states before Jim Crow laws, before the Civil War, where um, in early America, Black Americans and women could vote um, in some states, um, uh, generally if they own property. And typically property was the rule by which you voted, not demographics. And what happened uh, in the, uh, the post-revolutionary war, 1800 to 1860 period, it was the gradual expansion of the right to vote among those of that property that came at the expense of non-white uh, men and women. Um, in particular, uh, women could vote in New Jersey up until 1807 and very famously uh, uh, came out uh, in mass for a Federalist candidate. And so when the Democrats won, the disenfranchised women lost the right to vote. At least that's part of the story. History is always more complicated. I think this history explains, I think I'm going to um, You kind of go through this slide quickly. I just want to say that this history really explains how advocates are looking at the data today. You can't just dismiss the other side as being tinfoil hat people. So according to Heritage Foundation, they think that voter fraud, you know, they, they think that it's being dismissed politically. You know, they, they've identified 1,200 cases. You know, there needs to be an honest, from the Heritage Foundation's perspective, a honest conversation about the existence of fraud. Um, on the progressive side, you have the Brennan Center for Justice. They think that uh, the identified fraud, such as the stuff from the Heritage Foundation, is such a trivial percentage of total cases. Fraud is virtually non-existent. Don't worry about it. There's no reason to expand the right to uh, the accessibility. There's no reason to worry about fraud. And I didn't pick these two individuals randomly. You go to Ballotpedia, which when people Google vote to mail, this is what's coming up, Ballotpedia. Uh, it, it presents these two opposing viewpoints. So I think this is what people are getting when they, um, if they were to do their own research on the issue. Voting by mail has really then, I hope I've convinced you, become this latest battleground of election accessibility versus security and, and hence our interest in the topic. And so the 2020 election, um, at the time of us writing, we anticipated ultimately did rely on an unprecedented amount of voting by mail. Uh, obviously because of the pandemic, roughly half the electorate voted by mail, or sorry, half of the people who voted voted by mail. So I think it was 46% ultimately, although it's exit surveys, I think, that, that based on how the uh, uh, not all states distinguish exactly how um, votes are submitted. Uh, and, I'll, and, I'll say, uh, and anyway, I'll get to that towards the end. Since 2020, some states have a expanded access while other states have restricted it. Um, the restrictions generally come at the uh, concerns of fraud. So I think this type of research is still very topical. It's important to realize that voting by mail is a form of absentee voting, any vote that occurs outside your assigned voting station. And it's very old. It's not new. It's not a new, crazy strategy. Um, it began during the Civil war uh, when Union soldiers cast their vote for the 1864 general election. But you might say that it was specifically done back then to give Lincoln an edge. So over, soldiers overwhelmingly supported Lincoln. He got 75% of the soldier vote, only got 55% uh, of the popular vote. Although, uh, to be fair, the soldier vote was so small compared to the, uh, the total number of votes that it's hard to, to imagine he could bank on it. But of course, soldiers who vote right back to their family and say who you should vote for. It's also a kind of a remarkable election because McClellan, who was running against Lincoln, had, had been the general for so long and was, at, at, while he was general, particularly loved by, by his troops. So voting by mail today has expanded uh, basically in the last two decades, though, to the extent that it is 50% is basically the last two decades. It was about one-tenth of all votes in the general election uh, about in, in 2008, and by 2018, it was about 25%, one quarter. And um, any, any state, you can, in theory, request a ballot by mail. 16 uh, uh, require a valid reason. You have to explain why. It has to, it has to fall within a specific category. 34, you don't need a reason. You can just ask for it. And so uh, when we talk about vote by mail states in the paper, we specifically looked at states where they automatically mail ballots to registered voters. I have, I'm have i of the opinion that most voters are unaware they can vote by mail, uh, notwithstanding the pandemic. But in general, the states, you, you know you can vote by mail when you send a ballot. And, and we consider those to be these vote by mail states. This excludes the many uh, states. Uh, again, we exclude the states uh, during the 2020 that the vote by mail in light of the pandemic. We just didn't have fraud cases uh, following the 2020 election. We wrote it during the election. We were forward of those states, these states that, that automatically send ballots to registered voters as vote by mail states or states with vote by mail policies. We also looked at separately what we call to receive by mail states. States that, despite not mailing ballots to everybody, still had a lot of people participate in the election by mail. And we find similar things, uh, so I didn't really include it in this discussion. 
Um, so we did we did two analyses. Uh, the thought process being, let's do the simple analysis that demonstrates the result, and then we'll do the complicated one that we think addresses to the best for our ability these the latent confounders, the ways in which states and time periods vary. So it's the simplest thing you can do, basically difference and difference, this complete pooling analysis. Um, and what we did is we uh, combined, we compared vote by mail and non vote by mail states uh, into time periods. And so you had four data points and you compare them. And then we did this more complicated partial pooling analysis, which I feel to this audience, no need to motivate partial pooling, um, where we allow the fraud rates to vary by state and year. And I'm going to kind of walk through both and you know, encourage you to read the paper for details. And it's a very simple data set. I, you should download it and try your favorite method on it and see what you, what you come up with. So in this simple complete pooling analysis, what do we do? We ask this, it's the simplest thing. We ask, we ask what, you know, what, what can we get away with that's reasonable uh, evidence? And so we looked at the four years following the 2000 election, the four years following the 2016 election, and we did a before after comparison for both types of states, states with vote by mail policies and states without vote by mail policies. And then we compared the two comparisons, hence difference and difference. It's basically a linear model with a fixed time and policy effect. But what we found was, well, I'll show you the plot. I'd write it here, but I'll show you the plot. Here on the left, it's the, it's the uh, number of vote for, uh, cases per million votes. And so uh, states generally have between zero and two fraud cases per million votes. And then we have two time periods, uh, fraud between 2000 and 2004, mostly collected by News 21, who did a survey um, uh, in that era. And then we have the Heritage Foundation's fraud data set. And in the vote by mail states, we see a decline in, the, in basically the fraud rate. At baseline, vote by mail states have a higher fraud rate than non vote by mail states. The, the black intervals, the thick ones refer to one standard deviation, the thin ones are, are two standard deviations. But after the policy, fraud rates have dropped below vote by mail states below the non vote by mail states, which if you if you do difference and difference, you compare the trends, you're going to get the, the change uh, due to vote by mail states um, is an excess of the change that was happening just by time alone. Um, there's many reasons why you might not believe that analysis. Um, you might ask for a more complicated analysis. Of course, the data is more complicated. It's longitudinal data. You have 50 states across 10 years. So why not do a more complicated partial pooling analysis? So the second analysis, we follow Ruben, Holland, and Naiman, the so-called causal model, where we treat estimation as a prediction problem. We observe the, the uh, reported number of fraud cases that occur in a state with a vote by mail policy. Uh, what's missing? Well, it's the number of cases that would have occurred had the policy not uh, been in place. You know, we make these predictions, we predict these, these missing entries by partially pooling. We say partially pooling, you'd call it extrapolating, borrowing, sharing. I don't like partially pooling. I don't know what it means to partially pool or over pool or overfit. I love sharing. I like the idea of undersharing and oversharing, that models don't work when they overshare. That's a personal, but, but uh, people say partially pool, so I'll stick to it. Uh, what the partially pooling basically does is it creates these shared parameters so that th thereby states and time periods can learn from each other. It, so we'll talk about these hierarchical Bayesian models, but you, penalized regressions of a similar form. So we'll call these these frequentist random effects models, uh, these shared parameter models, which is the, the, the terminology in longitudinal data, a missing longitudinal data analysis. Um, we do matrix completion with nuclear norm penalization. There's a great paper recently in JASA by Athey et al. who do it in the longitudinal data causal in, in our context. I think it's a great paper. It's not that I necessarily believe their story so much as that when we charted on the data, it fit really well. And we'll talk about that in the paper. Uh, there's an implementation in R, the G-Synth package. So uh, uh, the, the way that the AT et al. paper is written is it builds on top of this literature and economics in synthetic controls. You can think about what's nuclear norm penalization. It's kind of like a Laplace prior or like a lasso, except you're, um, you're, the, you're, you're penalizing the singular values of the longitudinal data matrix. So it's, the, it's a similar idea, slightly different implementation. Uh, it, in this case, worked really well. So kudos to Athey et al. and then G-Synth for implementing it. And it was, uh, in particular, it was more robust to the zeros in the data set. There were some states that were, in some years that reported zero fraud cases. And that was throwing off even zero inflated models uh, for reasons I can talk about. Here's one graph we made where we looked at Washington state specifically. So the, the thin black line you see on the y-axis is charting over time the number of fraud cases. And this line is in 2011 is when Washington begins its vote by mail policy. And so the black line in some year had almost 60 uh, fraud cases. But then after 2011, it goes down to basically zero. These lines here, these non-thick lines, this, these shaded regions, are what the uh, matrix completion is trying to do. It's trying to say, all right, well, let's try to use the data from the states that didn't have vote by mail, by mail policies in order to predict what would have happened to, to Washington state in, in, after 2011 to come up with this counterfactual. 
And so because you're pooling states in this way, in the synthetic controls literature, they call it synthetic controls. Um, they, they probably wouldn't be too happy with my liberal use of synthetic here. They, uh, they have a weighting scheme where, where uh, as far as I can tell, New York is like, you know, Washington would be 30% Alabama, 40% New York, that they would uh, uh, they take the partial pooling, the, the weighted, very seriously, whereas I'm using it much more liberally here. But you can see here that that in the pre-period, the other states, the, by partially pooling, match the pre-trend very, very well. This was something that we couldn't get done by kind of zero inflated models. And then in the post-period, you see a nice uh, gap showing the effect of the policy. And of course, these types of longitudinal methods are counting for these time factors and these state factors. Uh, creating a much more compelling narrative. All right, so that's what we did. That's what we found. Uh, we, we we did a bunch of other models. I think we only wrote up two or three for the paper. Uh, we tried a bunch of stuff. We kept getting back the same answer. Expand vote by mail, fraud goes down. I believe it's real. It, I mean, if you believe the reported fraud cases, looking at the fraud cases, I believe it's real. I don't think it's evidence of a benefit. Um, I think it's an artifact. I don't think you can claim that by putting vote by mail, you're actually uh, having a protective effect. You yeah, might be able to, uh, you know, create some bend or backwards to create some type of argument. Maybe the vote by mail is being implemented in such a way is, is better on fraud. What I think is happening is that probably voter behavior isn't changing. What's happening is you have to remember that crime is a really bad measure. It's, it's, it's crime is determined by law. If you change the law, you've changed what's defined as a crime. So probably voter behavior isn't changing. What's changed is whether voter behavior is in violation of the laws. So what's going on? People who are formerly criminals are no longer criminals. People who are just because of confusion, voter confusion, submitting their ballots the wrong way, now have a ballot they just mail back. That's much simpler. It's much less likely that you'll screw up. And so to make my point about this voter confusion, um, you know, I would ask you, Eric, or people in the, in, who are viewing, um, do you know in your state, can an incarcerated person vote? Can a formerly incarcerated per person vote? I'm in Virginia right now. Felony conviction famously makes you ineligible to vote ever. You have to, your rights have to be restored by the governor. That was the case in Florida until recently. In Maine, anyone can vote regardless. What about, can, can, you, can you vote in person on election day uh, if you received a, a mail-in ballot? So in Virginia, the answer is no. You need to cast a provisional ballot. It's fraud to do otherwise. In New York, you could have requested it, received it, and returned it. And you can still uh, vote in person and that you're trusting that the uh, New York electorate will uh, cancel your proxy vote, sorry, your, um, your vote by, your, your, your mail your vote, and then just count the one you did in person. And that's why it makes it difficult um, in when you're comparing states to understand the different policies because they're so, uh, they're, um, we don't collect good data on how states run elections and we need to collect better data. So here's some references, uh, obviously, you know, Ruben uh, on, on, you know, potential outcomes. Um, this uh, Athey et al. paper, uh, you know, quite interesting. It, in JASA, it's the methodology we use, uh, implemented in the um, uh, generalized synthetic control method package. Um, you could you could implement. I don't see why you couldn't do uh, matrix penalization in Stan. I'll kudos to anyone that can explain to me how matrix penalization corresponds to a prior. You know, when when we do these type of matrix penal penalties, what assumption, what prior assumptions are am I making? I suppose it'll just, it's like a regular factor model. Anyway, you know, you know, explain to me how a matrix norm corresponds to a prior. Um, and then, of course, uh, you can look at the Brennan Center and um, uh, Heritage Spikowski at the Heritage Foundation for more insight into their arguments. I think one of the exciting things about being in the stats and public policy arena is um, there's a lot of opportunities to engage the public, to uh, create opportunities for people to better understand statistics and use it to participate in, in, in research, society, policy, et cetera. So that was the thought process behind this, part of the thought process at least behind this first international cherry bloom prediction competition that we've created that's gonna be running throughout February. I hope that you will, uh, anyone listening will consider joining. Um, basically it's, it's on, on its face very simple. You're gonna predict when the cherry trees will bloom in 2022. And so I'll first review the purpose of the competition. I'll talk about the rules and then I'll show you some of the data to just show you how, how it, you know, use your favorite model, how easy it is. And, and um, if your submission meets the criteria, which are on the website, you could win $5,000 courtesy of the American Statistical Association, other sponsors, the Caucus for Women in Statistics, uh, George Mason uh, and Columbia University. And so competitions open to anyone, you, your friend, your parents, your grandparents, uh, form a team. Uh, it's organized by David Keplinger at GMU, who's also at Mason, and then uh, Lizzie, who you heard from in, um, in the last talk, and myself. So the competition has two purposes. Uh, contribute to statistics education. Uh, use it in, if you're a teacher, use it in your courses. Give it to your students. Uh, they can learn about how statistics is used in climate change research. 
or just phenology in general, the study of the um, the life cycle, uh, uh, the timing of life cycle events, um, like the blooming of cherry trees, and uh, they'll get to apply the concepts they learn to a real problem. You know, regression, you know, uh, uh, machine learning, etc. You know, they can, they can hit the the random forest hammer as much as they want. We also want to raise awareness uh, to the use of statistics to study climate change so that people can really go out there and understand that, that statistics really does play a role. Um, and then the other purpose is to contribute to science, that these predictions could actually be useful. So um, citizen scientists, currently what they do now is if you're a citizen scientist, you share phenolo- phenology data. So say a cherry tree is grown in your backyard, you upload it to a website so that, that, that uh, biologists and phenologists can learn about it and better understand the ecosystem and how you know, climate change is affecting the ecosystem. Why can't predictions similarly be done? In particular, I would be interested, are we going to get a wisdom of the crowds? Perhaps everyone offers a weak prediction, but when combined, they yield a strong prediction. And can such soliciting many modelers ultimately be a solution to predicting? Uh, so it'd be nice to have some type of wisdom of the crowds effect. So how are you contributing to science if you participate? You know, how exactly? And so I want to go through kind of some of the motivations. There's, a, there's many reasons to predict the timing of phenological events. We have partners who care about the health of plants and animals represented by these records. Cherry trees obviously sustain an ecosystem from insects to humans. Cherry blossom festivals care because these, these festivals attract millions of viewers and they want to know when to come. You know, if you can't find out when they're going to bloom more a week in advance, how do you, how do you, um, how do you book your flight? Perhaps most importantly is that these records are evidence uh, that global warming is damaging the environment. And I think people take for granted that, that, that you can see the effects of climate change. Most of it you can't see. It's invisible. It can't be quantified. It's not comparable across time periods. Phenological records are kind of this great evidence in that they are very old. Um, some of the records, like for cherry trees, go back to 800 AD Japan, where they were noting the dates that the cherry trees bloomed. And they're highly sensitive to temperatures in the sense that as temperatures change, as the climate's changing over time, uh, life cycle events follow. And it's for that reason why this, the, if, you, if you know about the, the Paris Agreement um, that was negotiated in the Obama administration, the two degrees Celsius climate change limit um, was based in part on phenological data. So, uh, but and, and meanwhile, why it's such an important prediction problem, it's a very hard prediction problem. It's clear from the data, I'll show you in a second, that the bloom dates of cherry trees are getting earlier and earlier. The relationship between bloom dates and meteorological and other data is getting uh, is changing as well. The the relationship example between changing temperature uh, between temperatures and bloom dates uh, may be weakening um, as as climates warm. And so there's this growing volume of, of research looking at the dec- so-called declining temperature sensitivity. And it's this declining temperature sensitivity that could make predictions difficult if you use historic relationships between temperature and, um, and uh, bloom dates in order to predict the future. You have to account for this decline, which makes the prediction problem difficult. Another problem, of course, is uh, what's called the urban heat island phenomenon. Cities are growing. All these cherry trees that we're go- you're going to be predicting if you join the competition um, are near cities that are growing and radiating more heat. You have to account for that change over time, possibly. Uh, You'll find out. And so our competition partners are particularly interested in interpretable predictions that address these and other interesting phenomenon. And our partners include the National Phenology Network, um, which has supplied an excellent data set, Medio Swiss, who's actually going to call uh, the timing of some of the trees. The Vancouver Cherry Blossom Festival, who wants to know when the trees are going to bloom in Vancouver and have no data. And the uh, International Society of Biometeorology. And so we really thank our partners. So this is what uh, you're going to, you would do if you join the competition is we have four locations, basically uh, Japan, Switzerland, USA, and Canada. And we'll tell you exactly where the trees are. You can go, you can touch them, you can visit them. Uh, Here's their latitude and longitude and we give you their altitude. We'll give you historic data. Some of these go back, for example, Japan, you know, to 800 AD. Some of them like Vancouver, uh, the the, the, the uh, cherry trees, there's no data whatsoever. Um, They have slightly different definitions of when they're, they're groups of trees. So they bloom when a certain percentage of the, of, uh, so uh, it's, it's a, you can, we'll, we'll provide the definition in detail, but it has to do with how many buds on the tree bloom and then how many trees in the, in, in the area bloom. And that's the 50th percentile or the 70th or whatever here you see here is that it, when 70% of trees satisfy that criteria, it's bloomed. But it changes a little bit by area, we'll provide the details. I think it's probably negligible for the competition, but you should be aware. And then cherry trees, we have slightly different species. That you'll be that you'll be looking at. We we consider this a feature, not a flaw. Um, we're really looking for models that can extrapolate, can extrapolate across species, can extrapolate across different locations, and um, can extrapolate to Vancouver, which has no data. So while we'll give you data on Kyoto, you know, all, you know these three cities. You have to extrapolate, 
And we think the best model will be able to basically to extrapolate, you're demonstrating your model can essentially replicate whatever phenomenon you've discovered. This is what's kind of the data, the main data set looks like, as I was saying, you have these different cities, you have the latitude, longitude, and altitude, and we'll basically give you the year that for each year, the date they bloomed. We'll give you both the date and we'll give you the number of days. So in Kyoto in 2019, for these trees, they bloomed 95 on, on April 5th, 95 days after January 1st. And we'll give you more data. There's some uh, auxiliary data sets. So th this is all you need to make your predictions at, you know, but we'll give you auxiliary data sets. And we'll give you uh, cherry trees at other locations collected by the National phen phen um, Phenological Network. We'll give you some data from uh, Korea and Japan. And we'll show you how to use, uh, which is not hard, but the our NOAA package, or just how to use the Global Historical Climatology Network data. These are historic temperatures going back to 19, in some cases, before 1950. And of course, we want you to find your own data, as long as it's publicly available, that will give you a competitive edge that uh, you know fulfills some type of vision that you have that explains how the cherry trees bloom. And so just to be, uh, you know, just in a picture, um, each dot here represents the bloom date for various cities, Kyoto, Listel, Lystel, and Washington, D.C., here on the y-axis, we have the peak bloom date in days since January 1st, the year on the bottom. We're looking at all these different areas since 1880. And the gray line is simply the ordinary least squares. It's the the, the, um, the uh, regression line, simple linear regression line. And the little blue is the extrapolation. And you can see linear regression that the, the days are getting earlier across, across the, the world. But there's still substantial variation. And so the question is, uh, can you explain that variation? And moreover, can you predict Vancouver, for which you have no historical data? Obviously, uh, I want to point you to the competition rules. Go to competition.statistics.gmu.edu. That's where the competition are. Um, I put some of the details down here. Um, if you predict these cities, if you sorry, if you predict at these four sites and provide a compelling narrative, you could win as much as five thousand. Likely, the the prize is going to be split two ways: uh, two thousand five hundred to the person with the best predictions, regardless of their narrative, and two thousand five hundred to the person with the best narrative, possibly the same person or same team. You can join uh, on a team, uh, but you can only you can only be in one entry. You can't you can't submit multiple times. And we're going to provide you with a Git uh, a template. Uh, you'll do your work on, on Git, and then you'll upload it uh, your work so it's reproducible as we'll explain in the details. Uh, just to summarize, obviously, thanks for listening. Here's the, the, the flyer for the competition. It has our partners and sponsors on it, who we thank. It's been very helpful. Uh, the competition's open all of February. Uh, hopefully, uh, it's this talk has been part of a theme um, that, that statisticians are doing science policy, um, at, at least at the American Statistical Association, have long been doing it. And um, there are a lot of these cool projects around where uh, you can contribute to the dialogue. And uh, I think this competition is a very real way um, in order to um, engage in, in this uh, statistics and public policy. So again, Eric, thanks for having me. Thanks, that was great. Uh, can I ask, how, uh, how are you gonna score these predictions? Uh, it's on the competition website. I can't remember. I, I, I'm guessing it's mean squared error that um, <laughs> across the four sites, you make predictions for 2022. We wait till all the bloom dates come in. You know, we take your prediction, subtract the uh, what, what the date actually was, square them, you know, sum them up or take the average. Um, it may change. I'm sure the Bayesians are kind of licking their lips saying like, oh, wow, if I know the loss function, I can bake that into my into my predictions. So I think uh, that may be a major mistake. And we'll see for the next year whether or not the loss function has to be changed. Sounds like a, a, a super fun prediction challenge and difficult. Yeah. Uh, I remember talking to Lizzie uh, about it. It doesn't sound like there's a kind of a, even, even like a semi-mechanistic understanding of what, what this, for the process <laughs> that gives rise to this. So you have to essentially use regression methods, right? Uh, so of, it's, it's really fascinating. So, I mean, <clears throat> in, in, in some sense, this is the original statistics problem, right? You know, uh, mm -hmm. early, 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 uh, you know, I don't know, cave people or early, early farmers, when is it going to bloom? When can I farm the food, right? That's the original, and, and probably the original impetus to look at the stars and understand, um, you know, the seasons is to understand uh, when are my crops going to grow? When can I harvest them? How should I plan? When should I, you know, when should I uh, water the crops, et cetera? You know, when should I go to this 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 place and expect the blueberries? There was a, a kind of ignored in the statistics literature then for a very, very long time. Uh, Lizzie is going to provide a uh, on the website for like a history of like statistics and these um, so-called GDD calculations where they look at growing degree days. It, yeah, it's kind of been ignored. I don't know if it's limited to regression methods, but it's kind of like uh, any good idea. It may be that something as simple as figuring out the right covariates and regression does the trick. And what we want to stress here is that you don't have to predict any one area well. 
you have to, on average, predict all the areas, all four areas, better than everybody else. And we're hoping that your model is somewhat interpretable or insightful, that we can then learn something about what's driving this. Prediction efforts that I've seen so far are using long time series to look at one specific area. I think we're much more interested in your ability to extrapolate. Yeah, of course. That's the that's the juice. <laughs> All right. Uh, on the on the uh, main part of your talk, I think someone was looking for a, a link to the that Amicus brief. Do you have that? Oh yeah. Chance? Yeah, I can just put it in the chat. Is that how that works? Or the, yeah, I, I think that's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was quite an experience. Um, I, I found the the lawyers who um, I'll use legalese. I went through the board. The board gave their comments. The SA board it was a it was a prolonged effort, which I think made it better. But the lawyers, in particular, who legalese it, it was interesting to hear their rationale. I was like, I think you obfuscated this point. It's just a, it's a very different way of thinking. I'll say, and maybe I'll anger the lawyers out there. I don't know. <laughs> um, my experience has been, I want one theory that explains my data. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe people who do uh, uh, model uh, combining models, you know, or think about the multiplicity, you know. The, of, of a possible theory, but I generally want one theory that I think best explains the data. Lawyers are a lot of throwing stuff against the wall, seeing what sticks. They'll, they'll say, all right, theory A, you know, that could be true. And, and you have to take into consideration. But if A is not true, then maybe B is true. And what you can, like, you know, like, like either the person murdered or they didn't, you can say that person murdered. And if they didn't murder, they encouraged somebody else to do the murder. So you got to pick a story. Anyway, that's been my observation. Interesting. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Uh, fascinating talk. Uh, great competition. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, we'll see everybody next month. Yeah, thanks, Eric.